catch up on stories, and we will definitely let you know when we get a chance to, to hear from them all, uh, maybe in a, in a few weeks here after they've, you know, recovered from jet lag and had some time to think about everything. Uh, but yeah, this morning we're continuing our series in Colossians, and, and thank you, Julie, for reading that chapter <coughs> there, in a, or, or that passage there in chapter three. Uh, but every day we go about our lives uh, and according to certain sets of rules and abiding by certain regulations and expectations that are, that are codified within our culture, that our society tells us, hey, if you want to kind of do things rightly, this is the right way to live. Some of them are simple, and they're introduced to us at a very young age. Things like, you know, if I were to say, look both ways before you, you would naturally be able to say, cross the street. Yeah, absolutely. Um, other such cultural codes <coughs> of conduct help us as we strive to live peaceably with one another and establish maybe common morality. The, the most common example of this would be the golden rule of treat others the way you want to be treated. These sayings and standards are, are so well-known, are, are so widely accepted, that if I were to change them in any way, or if I were to add something to them, you would immediately pick up on that, and, and you'd want to know why, why I've made that change or that addition. If I were to say, look both ways before crossing the street, and then only do so while using a crosswalk, or only do so while holding the hand uh, of a friend, you'd probably be curious about these changes. You'd want to know why I made them, and, and what impact they may have on your lives if you decided to follow them as well. The Apostle Paul does something very similar to this today in, in Colossians chapter 3. Throughout the letter of Colossians, he has been trying to help believers better understand just how much Jesus profoundly and, and really boundlessly influences everything about their lives. Once you follow Jesus, you begin to realize and, and you shape your life around the truth that everything comes under the authority of and submits to the Lordship of Christ. And because of this, <clears throat> whoop, no, because of this, I want to turn my page correctly. Because of this, nothing about your life, nothing about your life, not your identity, not your desires, your purpose, your character, your relationships, nothing can remain unchallenged or unchanged once you make it your heart's desire to, uh, to whatever you do, whether you do it in word or deed, do it because and in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And so in the process of helping his readers better understand this all-encompassing impact that Christ will have on their lives, Paul turns his attention to what it will mean to keep Jesus as the ultimate authority in the roles and the relationships in your household, which often include the most important relationships in our lives. This morning, we're going to take a look about, about why Paul did this and, and take a look at the context that this was in so we can better understand. But before we really go any further, I, I want to make a few things very clear about this passage. I know for many people, and, and for probably some here today, when, when you hear this passage, you know that it's got a reputation. And maybe for you, the reputation of this passage is one that is, that is hard, and maybe one that is, that is not necessarily the best that you, that you can think of. Throughout history, Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 4, verse 1, has been inappropriately and illegitimately, illegitimately been used to, to, uh, to justify sinful, terrible things. Women have been told that they are less valuable, less capable, and of lower status than men, drawing that lesson from this passage. Children have been made to believe that they must comply with anything adults tell them. Any adult that's in a position of power, they've been told this passage says you must obey. Church Christians and pastors and churches, both in the past and today, have used this passage to defend slavery and the subjugation of human beings to one another. Because from this passage, they would argue that Paul says it's a good thing, it's a biblical thing, so it must be something we accept. I want to be very clear before we go any further that there is nothing, there is nothing in this passage that justifies any of the interpretations that I just described. God's word does not teach that women are inferior to men. God's word does not teach that children are at the mercy of or under every single command that any adult might tell them. And it most certainly does not defend slavery as something that is good or that should be required. I hope to make this more clear as, as we move through the passage this morning, but I wanted to say this up front so that we were, we were clear on before we entered this passage. <clears throat> any interpretation... Any interpretation of this passage that diminishes the value or the worth of a person is wrong. Right? Any interpretation of this passage that diminishes the value or the worth of a person is wrong. It should be rejected. And if we find traces of that within our own lives, within our own beliefs, within our theology, then we need, need to be sure that we take that seriously and repent. We need to bring that before the Lord and have him teach us how we can move away from those understandings and ones that are into, more, more into and in line with what he's actually trying to say here. 
I believe that the main point Paul wants to make in this passage, both looking at his historical context and then looking at how, it, how it's applied, the main point that Paul wants to make is that as a Christian, your role in your household is subject to the authority and the lordship of Christ. Right? As a Christian, your role in, in, in your household is subject to to the authority and the lordship of Christ. Ultimately, if you are a follower of Jesus, then you have to strive to, to, to conform your role as a wife, as a husband, as a mother or a father, a son, a daughter, or any other part of your familial relationships. You have to conform that to the expectations that we see Christ lay out. He is the authority that we are all together striving to follow. Our understanding of how we treat and interact with one another must be grounded in our obedience to him. And before we get into the text itself, we need to be able to consider the, the historical and cultural context that Paul is talking about here. Perhaps, unlike any other passage in Colossians, what's going on at the time that Paul is writing will best inform how we can understand what he's trying to ask of us and command us to do here. It may seem odd that as this passage kind of comes in through Colossians chapter 3, that all of a sudden, without any sort of a transition or introduction, Paul starts listing off these orders to wives and husbands and children and slaves. But to his readers in the first century, this sort of list would have been very, very familiar. Most of the cultures within the Roman Empire had something that was called a household code. They were the standard cultural expectations of what a home would look like and how it would operate if it was living according to society's ideal for family and community. Long before Paul ever wrote the letter to the Colossians, a Greek philosopher named Aristotle popularized what would become the most standard version of these household codes. You can look them up online if you want to, if you just Google Aristotle household codes, they'll pop up. You can have all the fun you want to going down that rabbit hole. For my purposes today, I'm just going to summarize the, the, the parts that, most, uh, th that have the most impact on what we see Paul trying to do in this passage. According to Aristotle, there were three key relationships in any home, or at least any good Greek home that was trying to, to contribute well to society. And those relationships were masters and slaves, fathers and children, and husbands and wives. The husband exercised authoritative rule over his wife and children. The slave master, which was, not, which was most of the time the husband, but not always, the slave master had full authority over the slave, and the slave was not considered a full person under Roman law. So ultimately, according to the culturally codified and community-utilized household rules at this time, the, the husband, the father, the man of the house, had nearly unquestioned authority on the basis of, of his assumed natural superiority. That's what Aristotle was writing. That's what the Romans believed. That's how they ran their households. In other words, <clears throat> first century Christians lived in a culture that believed that the man, that, that, that the father, that the husband of the house ought to have be the central authority on all matters of his home and family. And, and what's very important for us to understand is that within this culture, that authority could be and was often encouraged to be domineering, self-centered, and chiefly concerned with the preservation of power and status. That's why the household code existed, was to, pervert, was, was to preserve that status for, uh, for the husband. Paul wrote this letter to the Christians in Colossae because they were struggling against false teachers. And so it's reasonable to assume then that Paul had been asked to address what these teachers were saying about the authority in one's household. Perhaps the Christians in Colossae had wondered, well, if, if, we're all, uh, <clears throat> if we're all united in Christ and if we're all therefore equal before the Lord, as Paul has already said in this letter and in other places, how can we then go on running our homes in such a way that clearly depends on a hierarchy that is based on the assumption that a wife is inferior to a husband, that children are inferior to their parents, or that slaves are inferior to all other people? With this in mind, Paul responds with this passage. He's not creating or defining a new system of what a Christian household governance should look like. And he's not prescribing the ideal Christian household. What he's doing is he's commenting on a system that is already in place and helping believers understand how they might navigate that system while still remaining true to their Christian faith. And what he ends up telling them is that as a Christian, your role in your household is subject to the authority and the lordship of Christ. Christ. 
So fresh off a series of commands of how Christians should live in community with one another within the church, which is what we looked at last week, <clears throat> Paul turns his attention to this family community, and he says this. He says, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now, wives submit to your husbands is straight out of every household code that you would have found in the first century. That would have had everyone saying, yes, we understand that, we know that, we've heard that. However, the addition of the wife's reason and motivation for that submission, being her obedience and authority to Christ and not her husband, that would have made people sit up in their chairs. That would have made them sit forward and say, no, wait a minute, what, what was that last part you just said? That her submission is to Christ and not first and foremost to her husband. That would have been something new. And then Paul really begins to shake things up when he adds the command for husbands to love their wives. Again, requiring wives to submit to their husbands, that was something that they had heard before. But the requirement for husbands to love their wives was not part of any of the household codes at all at this time. These two verses signal a cataclysmic change in the role and authority that Christians have in their households. If a wife is going to submit herself to her husband based on what she believes is the best practice for following and obeying Christ, and if a husband is then going to assume the responsibility of loving his wife and giving, and giving him this task that brings his relationship down into the realm of mutual humility and mutual partnership, then what that means is that there has been a serious change to the structure and a serious change of who is in charge in a Christian's home and a Christian's marriage. See, the Romans believed, and the culture for the most part agreed at this time, that the husband was the center, unquestioned authority in the family, that no one else could take that space, and that all members of the household had to submit to his rule and his rule alone. But for followers of Christ, there is space for only one ultimate authority in our lives and in our family and our households included. Paul removes the, the husband, the father, from that central, unquestioned place and that, that space that the culture was defining, and instead he declares that that only and rightly belongs to Jesus Christ alone. So men then join women, they join children, they join their wives, their son, their daughters, and, and in Paul's day, they would have joined slaves in this instance, in building relationships one another, with one another that are mutually loving and caring and good and kind. Paul says both husbands and wives are called to make Christ the Lord of their lives and the authority in their homes. And if you're following with me so far, you might think, okay, that, 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 kind of, that sounds fine, and theologically I can see how you got there, but what does it actually mean? What, what do we actually have to do to submit and to love in the way that we're being told here? Submission is, of course, a very tricky and, and triggering word for some of us today. It gets a lot of bad press, and it gets associated with a bunch of modern definitions that do not fit at all with what Paul was trying to say. Furthermore, I think it's important to keep in mind that while Paul applies the concept of submission here to wives only, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, which he wrote to another church, submission is clearly said to be an act that is to characterize all Christian relationships and all Christian community, including those in the home. Out of our reverence to Christ, we all must learn how to humble ourselves and live in service and surrender to one another. Still, we need to take the commands that Paul lays out here for wives to submit to husbands and hus husbands to love their wives. We need to take this seriously. So what I'm going to share with you is my best attempt to understand these commands as a Christian, as a theologian, as a pastor, as a preacher, and as a fellow believer with you, standing shoulder to shoulder, side by side, trying my best to understand this. What I'm going to offer you is, is, is my best understanding and simply ask that you consider it. I'm not telling you that you must agree with how I describe this here, but I offer it to you just as something to consider and, and take to the Lord as, as a possible way forward. A wife's submission to her husband is her voluntary act of serving her husband, helping him when he is in need, and being a supportive partner committed to working together in the growth and flourishing of their marriage. Right? A wife's submission to her husband is her voluntary act of serving her husband, helping him when he is in need, and being support, a supportive partner committed to the working together for the growth and flourishing of their marriage. A wife's submission to her husband is not blind obedience to any idea or any desire of her husband. It is not doing whatever he says or whatever he wants, especially if what he is demanding is in conflict with her obedience and her faith in Christ. And I want to be very clear about this. Submission can never, ever justify an abusive relationship. 
Submission to one's husband cannot justify an abusive relationship. Marriage is a covenant. It is a promise between two people. And abuse, be it physical, verbal, emotional, or spiritual, seriously damages that covenant. It damages that promise. And while I absolutely believe in the power of forgiveness and God's redemptive ability to repair relationships that we have broken due to our broken promises, that does not mean that a woman is required to remain in a place or with a person that is abusing her. That's not what the Bible teaches. A husband's love for his wife is his intentional commitment to put her needs and interests first, to never use his cultural or spiritual authority in a way that diminishes his wife's dignity or drives her to bitterness and requires him to be a supportive partner committed to working together in the growth and flourishing of their marriage. Again, a husband's love for his wife is his intentional commitment to put her needs and interests first, to never use his cultural or spiritual authority in a way that diminishes his wife's dignity or drives her to bitterness and requires him to be a supportive partner committed to working together for the growth and flourishing of their marriage. A husband's love for his wife does not mean doing whatever she wants or whatever she says. It does not mean putting her on a pedestal to the point where she becomes an idol for him, a, a, an object of worship. And a husband's love for his wife also does not mean that he must simply grin and bear abuse in silence either. Again, there is no biblical justification or requirement for accepting or putting up with abuse in any relationship. It's just not what's taught there. The key to getting all this right, to, to understanding how husbands, or husbands can love and wives can submit, the key to getting all this right is to look to Christ and understand what he instructs and not have the culture tell you how this works. We can't have our culture inform how our marriage is supposed to look. We submit to the lordship and the authority of Christ. There is no greater example of what beautiful, voluntary servanthood looks like than that of Christ towards us. So wives... If you want to submit to your husbands, do so in careful reflection of the pattern of submission that Christ laid out for us with his life. There is no greater example of love leading someone to put others' interests ahead of themselves other than that of Christ doing so for our benefit. So husbands, if you want to love your wives well, do so in careful reflection of how Christ modeled and made the example of love for us with his own life. A rich Christian marriage is one in which husbands and wives are helping one another pursue Christ together. If you are each subject to the authority of the Lordship of Christ, then you are walking side by side in an effort to walk in righteousness together. And if you happen to be with us this morning and you are a Christian, you are a believer, but your spouse is not, then I hope it is some comfort to you to know that your circumstances are probably a lot more like who Paul was writing to at this time. It's entirely possible that this church community he was writing to had plenty of men and women who are believers, but their spouse, their husband or wife was not. That's the beauty of making Christ your true authority. Because you can submit to a non-believing husband and you can love a non-believing wife in this pattern because your obedience is not truly first and foremost to one another, but it's to Jesus himself. In doing so, in, in living out this pattern, you may actually end up being a brilliant witness of the gospel and of the love of God to the one you love and are promised to. So this morning, we must ask ourselves, is it your desire, is it your desire to make Christ the true Lord and authority of your marriage? Will, you, will your partnership together be one that is ultimately about seeking and serving and obeying not each other, but first seeking and obeying and serving Christ, and then seeking and, ser and serving one another. So often when things are not going well in our marriage, or really in any of our intimate relationships, the first thing we do, the, the first thing we go to is trying to find the shortcomings in the other. If, if he was just better at this, or if she would just do that, then everything would be fine. And although it is true that every husband, every wife could always do better, we always have things that we could improve on and grow in, perhaps before we seek to blame the other, we should first consider whether or not we are truly living under Christ's authority and pursuing our marriage with him in mind. When conflict arises, and on those days where marriage is hard, and there are going to be plenty of days when marriage is hard, if we are quick to lash out at our spouse— instead of being quick to seek the Lord in prayer, seek him and ask for his guidance, 
we, ha we have to go to him first to figure out how is it that we could better love one another. That, that's the strategy that's being advocated for here. Seek out Christ and have that be the basis of how you come together with one another in your marriage. The second relationship Paul addresses in the household is parent, between that of parents and children. At verse 20, he says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Paul's address to children is, again, unique when compared to the other household codes of this day. Most ancient codes would not have treated children as responsible people, needing to be respected, needing to be included as members of the community the way that Paul treats them here. He address, addresses them directly. Most of the time, children were actually thought of as property, or at least as, as future prospects, prospects, as extensions, and a way of securing and continuing the legacy, most chiefly of that of their father. But Paul gives them much greater status than this. Children are invited to understand their relationship to Jesus as well. And, and, to, and they're challenged to start considering how they too might live under the lordship of Christ, how they might reflect on and live out their own faith. Now, the command given to children is a bit more rigid, and it's a bit more authoritative than the one given to characterize the relationship between husbands and wives. The, that was submit and love, and here we have a different word, and distinctly a word for obey. Children, obey your parents in everything. I think one of the things we need to understand is, is kind of the limits here. Who are the children, and what are they supposed to do? And I think a possible way forward is this. As long as children are living under the protection of their parents, then I think it's fair to suggest that the expectation, the biblical expectation here, is that they obey their parents in as many ways as possible. And there needs to be lots of room for grace there. There needs to be lots of room for patience. But that's still the call that we want to give to our children. You need to obey your parents in as much as it is possible. When children are no longer under the direct protective care of their parents, then that relationship may transition to one that is more of honor and respect, but not necessarily of direct obedience. However, I want to once again make clear, this does not excuse any form of parental abuse toward a child. Abuse is a failure of a parent's or caretaker's role toward the responsibility they have for that kid. I think it's actually really beautiful that God made it clear that kids can participate in faith and discipleship of Christ. My oldest daughter is two years old, and she's just starting to pick up on it and remember the things we tell her about, about who God is and about who Jesus is and, and what it means to love your neighbors and care for others and, and, and why we need her to listen to mom and dad and actually do the things that we ask her to do. And I want her to grow up knowing that if she listens to me, to me and she listens to her mother, then she's going to be listening to advice that really is meant for her, uh, for her protection, for her betterment, for her growth. But also that it's not just about obeying us, but that her obedience to what we're asking her to do may actually bring a smile to the face of God. Kids can make God happy. Kids can bring joy to the heart of God. I think that's an incredible thing that we're taught here. It is within the realm of possibility for children to make God happy. But Paul's command is not just to children. Again, he reminds fathers that their authority is not absolute. Part of the responsibility of being a father is treating your children in such a way that the expectations you set before them and the obedience that you ask of them is reasonable and fair and grounded in the hope of their healthy development. Fathers, and honestly, I think it's fair to expand this to other parents, to all parents and all caretakers, but here it says fathers must love and discipline and lead their children so that they know that one of the most important relationships they'll ever have in their life, one of the most important adults that they'll ever know is for them, is in their corner, is someone that can be trusted and depended upon. Paul does not want to see kids losing their will to obey their parents or seek God or be productive members of their family because their fathers or their parents are too cruel or too harsh, dismissive or unloving. Jesus may never have been a biological father. He, he never married and he never raised children of his own, but through his life, death, and resurrection, he created an enormous adoptive family of brothers and sisters and sons and daughters. And that binding, and the binding unifying instruction he gave them to bring them all together was love. He said, of the family, he said of his family that he was creating, he said, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now where I am going, you cannot come. 
a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So fathers, hear me clearly. Parents, hear me clearly. The expectation of Christ, the expectation, the command of your king and your savior and your ultimate authority in all things, including your family and how you raise your kids is this. Love your children. Care for them. Sacrifice for them. Pursue their best interests before your own. Now, you're gonna mess this up from time to time. You're gonna get it wrong. But part of, of getting it wrong, part of what a loving person does when they know they've done something wrong, when they know they've hurt someone, is they seek that person out and they're willing to say, I'm sorry. It is okay to say, I'm sorry to your children. A loving person learns that and repents and grows from the things that they've done wrong, the mistakes that they have made. Commit to loving your kids and getting better at it every single day. The last household relationship Paul addresses is the one that's hardest to find a parallel for in, in our lives today. Paul says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it, not only when their eye is on you and to curry favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence to the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will re be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your, slave, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Because you and I no longer live in a culture here uh, that accepts or allows for slavery, I'm not going to spend very much time drawing out applications or, or drawing out uh, direct lessons from these verses. I do think there are some really good principles for, for how we might uh, better understand our working relationship, how we might better understand what it means to be a worker and, and be an employer and, and, and those sort of things. What I would encourage you to do is to actually our, our senior pastor, Steve Ratliff, who's on sabbatical right now, Back in January, on January 23rd, he preached a sermon from this passage, drawing out the applications for what, what it might mean for your, for your work and how this passage might be able to enlighten that relationship. Uh, that, that sermon's title was Faith at Work Part 2, and the at was the little at sign. Faith at Work Part 2 on January 23rd. If seeing this passage in light of what it means for your work is something you'd like to do, we have all those sermons archived on our website, and I encourage you to go back and, and find it there. What I wanna do now is instead provide some clarification about something that is often misunderstood about what Paul is trying to do with these verses. Again, we need to remember that Paul is striving to help his mostly Gentile church understand how they might continue to live according to these household codes that the culture basically demanded while also maintaining their obedience to Christ. So Paul speaks to slaves and slave masters because these were deeply entrenched roles within the Roman society. And it's easy to read this passage in isolation and feel like Paul is just wholesale saying slavery is okay. But we need to consider a few things that are happening here. First of all, Paul addresses slaves as people with value and worth, and he equalizes them with the others in the Christian community. This was drastically and subversively different than the view that, of, that most had of slaves in this culture at this time. Their earthly status as slaves did not impact their true identities as sons or daughters in Christ. Paul decisively then reorients both slave and master to their true mutual master, which is God in heaven. He tells both the slave and the slave master that they worship the same God, that they come to the same God on the same level to pray and worship, that they will be judged by that same God. Paul never endorses slavery. There's, there's not, what he's not doing here is he's not approving of slavery. He explains how the institution might continue to work within a Christian framework, but that is a long, long way from ratifying it. Everything Paul writes about slavery, both here and other, in other places in the Bible, it continues to call people to remember that their ultimate authority is, is the Lord. It continues to draw people back to that idea of lordship in Christ. And in fact, everything that Paul wrote about slavery, both here and in, and in other places, quite honestly, it would make it almost impossible for a believer to continue to do anything other than, than honor and, and bestow personhood and bestow love upon their slave. 
and, and to see them as a human being. And as they moved down that road, it would be very hard for them to do anything other than consider what it might be like to free that person. It would be radically different than any other relationship between slave and slave master that you saw in Roman society. Because Paul believed that there is no other master other than Christ, that he is the true, ultimate master of our lives. He believed that there is no authority more important or more authoritative than that of Jesus. Our authority reigns in heaven. Our commands come not from the power of the hierarchy that human beings create, but from Christ and Christ alone. And so as Christians, we must maintain that our roles in our household are subject to the authority and the lordship of Christ. So I ask you to submit to the Lord to lean into the love and the kindness and the humility and the good treatment of all people that he expects of the people who call him their God and who follow him with their lives. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, this passage is often heavy and it's often complicated. It's often hard to see through, but what I hope, Lord, is that we can all look to it and see goodness and see how you are instructing us to, to think not of, of who's in charge or, or who has more power, but to look to the Lord and say, yes, that is my Savior. That is my authority. Jesus is the one that I want to follow and model my life around. Father, I'd ask that you do indeed today draw husbands to love their lives well in the pattern that you taught. I ask that you would draw wives to submit to their husbands in the way that you were such a brilliant, servant-hearted person. Father, draw parents and children together in love. Call us to remember who our true authority is. Lord, I'd ask that even for those who are here this morning who may be single, uh, Lord, those who, who may have gone through the, the, the heartbreak and the hardship of divorce, Lord, even those that, are, that don't have these direct relationships that go one-to-one -one parallel with their lives, that you would still call them to draw the goodness out of what it means to make Christ the Lord of their life and to follow you into this passage in that, in that light and seek you to be that central, uh, central true authority because your word is good and your leadership is good. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.